first, though. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yay! Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and get this started. I'm going to hand the mic off to Keegan from Retrieving Freedom and let her start telling us all a little bit more about their organization. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having Abe and I here today. Our rule is dog first, so if he breaks a command at any time, I'm just going to stop mid-sentence and fix him. Um, every moment is a training opportunity, so we'll get him in the right position. So he's just going to hang out at first. I'll talk about our program and then answer some questions, and we'll do a little demonstration. So <coughs> first, we train service dogs for veterans with disabilities and children with autism. Um, the reason we have those two groups of clients is because of the types of dogs that we use. So we use mostly labs, golden retrievers, and golden doodles. Those three breeds have a lot of different personalities within them, if you have had any of those breeds. Um, for the lab, actually for all three of them, we either see a pretty high energy level or a pretty low energy level or what we call the off switch, which is where they have both, but they know when it's appropriate to use them. So we look for dogs with the off switch. And that is because when they have their vest on, they are in work mode. They have to ignore toys, ignore distractions. They can't jump at the food on the ground. They can't go up and greet everybody. They have to be focused on their job at hand. Well, if you get a lab who is constantly looking for the next toy to chase or sees a bunny and thinks, I don't care that I'm on a leash, I'm gonna rip your arm off to go get it. Um, probably not a good service dog. So we teach them vest on, work mode, vest off, you can play. The higher energy dogs are typically going to veterans. So the veterans that we see are the ones who are closing the curtains, staying at home, maybe self-medicating, they are afraid to go in public or they simply just don't trust people or don't trust themselves. Maybe they have flashbacks pretty frequently and they feel safe at their own home when those happen. So if we give them a high energy dog who has an off switch and can sleep at night, but has more energy than our autism dogs, um, it's gonna force them to go outside. You know, the dog is going to look at you and say, I'm restless. We've been inside since we woke up. We need to go for a walk now. Or we need to go play some fetch in the backyard. And eventually, it, it takes the force out of it, and the, the veteran will want to do that with their dog. They're bonding. They're having a good time. And they start to feel more comfortable because that dog is next to them and doing that with them. On the flip side, we have children who can't sit still. They're constantly looking for buttons to push or light switches to flip. Uh, we have one child that comes up and always pushes every button on our washing machine, um, which is, it's fantastic. It's very fun for him, which we support. And if we were to give them a high energy dog, it's just gonna ramp it up, right? So we give them a nice dog who loves sleep, but will still play fetch once in a while to get that energy out. But they're not the dog who's going to be playing fetch until they drop. They're gonna play maybe five times and then say, okay, let's go take a nap again. So eventually, and the children are physically attached to the dog through a tether system. It, they wear a belt and it hooks up to the dog's vest and it has a combination lock so they can't just take it off. And then they have their own handle, which gives them a job to focus on. So. They are hooked up to their dog if they try to run. It pulls on the tether on their vest, which is on a different spot on their body than their leash. And the dog knows, I'm feeling that tether on my tummy. I need to lay down. And then it's, it's keeping the child from running off. So when children try, you know, they see um, a toy in the next aisle or they see a leaf blowing that they have to chase. Thank you. Down they have that impulsivity they just want to go they don't think about a car could come hey <laughs> nothing in there for you come here there down thank you they don't think about the the potential danger or getting lost one mom told us um, she knew it was time for a service dog when she lost her son ran off in Walmart, and when they found him, he was throwing papers around in the manager's office. And she was like, okay, I can't have constant eyes on my child with two other children next to me and get my groceries and pay for them and look for cars coming. 
So they got a service dog. The child was tethered to the dog. She said, when they came to us, he was bolt bolting five out of five times. After a couple of years, he was bolting one out of five times. And now they can go on walks around their neighborhood with no tether. And he's not going anywhere. So what happens is they get tugged back to the dog so many times that it's not fun anymore, right? They think, okay, going for that toy in the next aisle is not worth it because my dog won't let me. My dog wants me to stay here next to them. And we kind of use the dog as a guide. We are using the dog to say, well, does Abe want to go in the next aisle and get the toy? And they say, no, he's, he's fine right there. Okay, then you're fine right there, right? You should stay next to Abe. Good boy. So we kind of use them as a, a role model, per se. Good boy. So uh, the other reason we like the breeds that we use is they're a good size. They're not too big that they can't crash on top of our legs and cause pressure or um, hurt us, I guess. But they're not so small that it's not making an impact. It's going to get our attention. They're also a good size for that tethering. They can hold back a child. Now, if a child is older, they're, they're probably going to be able to drag them, but the dog is not a babysitter. They always have somebody holding their leash. Um, what else? Oh, they're, they're known as family dogs. They're nice dogs. They look nice. They're good with all sorts of people. So when, they, uh, when we're out in the store with them, people aren't usually afraid to approach us. We can still be approached if somebody needs our attention. Um, but I would say, going off of that, don't approach somebody just because they have a dog. Um, and we'll get to that, too, in a little bit. But those are the main reasons. They're also tall enough, so if a veteran drops something and the dog needs to retrieve it, which we'll demonstrate, we're not having to still bend over to pick it out of their mouth. They can just kind of drop it right in our hand. And that keeps our veterans with maybe bad balance or bad back from toppling over or losing their balance or something like that. If they do, we have a command called brace where the dog locks all four of their legs and we can push kind of on the t top of their shoulder blades and it allows us to put balance or pressure onto them to stand up to sit down to make sure that we are not falling some of them will have a harness on their back so if a veteran's walking along holding the harness and they feel like they're going to lose their balance they can kind of pull on the harness to to keep their balance that way so they're honestly they're they're a medical device they are keeping people safe they're keeping our veterans safe from uh, hurting themselves from falling. They're keeping our children safe from running into traffic or manager's offices. Um, and they're just going to keep people comfortable, keep those moms a peace of mind that they don't have to hold their child's shirt or, you know, have one parent stay at home with that child while the other parent goes to the store with the other children. It's just we don't want families separated like that. So the dogs can really help in that sense. Good boy. Let's see, some other tasks for veterans. Um, mobility, so if we are using a wheelchair and we're kind of at a slight ramp and I've just had a really long day, my arms don't want to push myself up the ramp, the dog can kind of tug us up that little hump to keep us going. If we're having a hard time going backwards, they can put their feet on our lap and walk and it pushes us backwards. Um, again, that brace to help us get out of our wheelchair and maybe transfer to um, our bed or our chair. We have one veteran who has fallen out of his wheelchair getting into the shower. So then he called his dog to him and he was able to brace because there was nothing else around him. Um, other mobility, uh, picking up canes or prosthetics, pushing handicap buttons. Um, you know, if, Even if we have our hands full, the dog can go ahead of us and push the handicap button for us picking up dropped items, retrieving items from a refrigerator, getting the remote off the table for us. If we already took our prosthetic off and don't want to um, call somebody in from the next room, they can, one veteran taught his dog, as soon as you finish your breakfast, you go into the bathroom and open the bottom drawer and you bring me the bag that's in there and that's his daily medication. So then he doesn't forget to take his medication. His dog reminds him every morning, here's your medication. Dogs are so smart. We just have to put a, a task to it. They've got it all in there. Um, what else? Light switches for nightmares. They can turn on the light so that when we wake up, we know we're at home safe in our own bed. 
Some veterans prefer to be fully woken up and some prefer the dog just snuggle into them so they wake out of the nightmare but not out of their sleep because it's difficult to go back to sleep. Um, applying pressure, they pick up on when our moods spike in either direction. They smell it. They, they, we give off pheromones that we can't smell. And so that's why we require so much bonding with the dog so that they know your baseline. And as soon as we spike, they're going to try to fix it. Right? If we spike super excited, they're a mirror. They're going to get super excited with us. They don't know why, but they're going to, and that makes us happy. Right? It, then they're, they're right there next to us. If we spike and we start to get really anxious or really depressed, they are probably going to nudge us in some way, get our attention. They might put their head in our lap, which is called a visit, and apply pressure on our thigh. It basically requires us to pay attention to them, right? You can't ignore a dog in your lap. If you choose to, or the flashback is so severe that you don't notice them, they'll advance that and they'll put their feet in your lap and they'll maybe lick your face or nudge your neck. If we have tight fists, they might try to open our fists and have us pet them. Autism dogs will do that for children too. Um, but yeah, just that pressure therapy. They also, I didn't patting my leg too much. Um, they also do, <laughs> positional commands. A lot of veterans tell us that when they are overseas, many natives to that country spoke very closely to them. They had very tight quarters. And so they like positional commands. Our home base is the left. They do a front. So if somebody's approaching us, the dog will automatically go in front of us and kind of cut them off. We can do a right or a behind, and it just kind of protects whatever side. Protects whatever side we want them to keep an eye on so that we don't feel like we're constantly checking over our shoulder. That one. one veteran works in a cubicle, so she has one open wall. She also wears a headset. When people need her, they're approaching her from behind and tapping her shoulder, which triggers her. She does not like that. So she taught her dog who sits in her line of sight that when somebody is behind me, you sit up. So he goes from a down to a sit and then she sees the visual aid that somebody is behind her and she doesn't have to be touched. So she really appreciates that. And she taught her dog that on her own. So we do, we teach the people just as much as we teach the dogs. Everyone uses different commands for their dogs. We have to make sure that we're using all of the same ones from person to person. In his lifetime, Abe will probably have 15 different handlers within his training. And then he'll be placed with one more person. So if any of those people use different commands, he's gonna be lost. He will have no idea what they're asking him to do. Some other commands for autism, it's a little bit harder to grasp until you see it, but dogs can be a social bridge and teach children to communicate appropriately with other kids their age. They can give children the confidence to speak. Some children are mute by choice. Dogs are very easy to talk to for two reasons. One, they love us no matter what, right? People do not do that. We can't. The other thing is they are non-judgmental. People also cannot do this. We are making judge, bless you, scared me. <laughs> We're making judgments all day long. And uh, we just can't help it, but dogs, they live in the, the present moment no matter what. So if something bad happens to them, they might have a faint memory of it, but they don't necessarily remember who did it. My favorite analogy is to say you lock your spouse or your, your friend or your parent or whoever in a closet with your dog and come back six hours later, which one's excited to see you, <laughs> right? They don't remember you put them in the closet, they just remember you got them out. It's not the other way around for your partner. Um, so they, uh, they're non-judgmental, they love unconditionally. So we use dogs a lot in the classrooms. So if we have kids who are struggling to learn how to read aloud or they don't have the confidence for that, they practice with the dog. The dog's not gonna laugh at them. They're not gonna correct them. They're gonna give them the space to fix that word themselves. So we have um, probably 10 different dogs that go to elementary schools throughout the school year working with teachers, working with students. Um, we work with various college campuses, and I think we're getting close, Claire. <laughs> Perfect, you keep me updated. <laughs> um, 
but we work on Iowa State's campus, Wartburg, UNI, um, University of Missouri, and we have dogs there because it's a great learning opportunity for fosters. Dogs from eight weeks to about their first birthday are raised in a foster home where they are working directly with that individual or that family and they are learning basic obedience, they're learning their name, they're learning how to walk on a leash, they're learning what their vest means, which is probably the most important thing they could ever learn as a service dog. Um, by about five months old, I would say they understand when their vest is on, they're all work. Um, just exposure is the number one thing in foster homes. As a small, sta small staff, we can't take 50 dogs out every day, uh, puppies, we can't take them home. Um, and get them exposed to grocery carts and baseball games and cafeterias and all of the things that we do on a daily basis. So foster homes are so, so helpful. Um, we do training for that where we're training you ahead of time and then continuous training throughout the dog's first year. Just so you know what you're supposed to be working on at that age, what tasks are coming up. Um, one foster didn't recognize that her dog was walking funny and it turned out he had hip dysplasia at six months old. Um, so he was medically released from the program, but fosters are just the most important people within our organization. From there, the dogs enter for uh, stage two formal training, where they're working at our facility with our professional training staff, and they're starting to learn different tasks that could probably go either direction. And then once they're just a little bit older than Abe, who is 15 months, we're gonna start to finalize whether they'll be an autism dog or a veteran dog and start to teach specific tasks for those two clientele. Um, every single dog will know different tasks by the time they're placed, just because every client is so different. But most dogs will have the same core tasks for their path that they take. And then, <laughs> don't lick that. Once they're uh, nearing their second birthday, probably about 18 to 20 months old, they enter stage three of training, which has a test to pass into. If they pass that test, they are ready to start meeting clients, where they start matching with different people. Each client works with probably three to five dogs before they find the right fit for them. We want it to be the right match before it's the fastest match. So we're making sure that your personalities get along. We don't get along with every single dog, I promise. I work with 20 dogs a day and I do not like all of them. Um, I, I like most of them, but we just don't get along with every dog and we can't force that. So we want to make sure temperaments match, personalities match, and that they are the, the right size and, and personality to provide what you need. Okay. So if we have, um, like we have a Vietnam veteran who frequently drops his cane and he has a really hard time balancing on his own. Um, if we were to give him a small lazy dog or a small super high energy dog, not gonna work. He has the tallest, laziest dog we've ever had in our organization who walks at his speed because he would prefer to sleep anyway. And if he drops something, and he picks it up, he does not have to move an inch. It's right in his hand. So that was a different case because veterans typically have higher energy dogs. So we just make sure we're matching the right dog to the right person. And because of that, it's, it's a pretty long process. We tell people it's about a minimum of 18 months from the time you submit your application to the time you walk out with a service dog. But it's 200 required hours with the dog itself and um, that's not just a waiting period. You're coming in and actively training with our trainers so that you get the skill set. You learn the commands, you know all of these things. And by the time we have your dog picked out, all you have to do is bond at that time. Any questions before we go into a demo? I just thought of a couple things I didn't hit on. So if no questions, I'll keep going just a little bit. Um, I know funding is a big question. We're a nonprofit. We write a lot of grants, especially last year when, when uh, donations were way down, we wrote a lot more grants. Um, but otherwise, word of mouth, we host fundraisers. Um, some clients, because we don't charge for the dog itself, some clients choose to raise money from their family and friends or neighbors. Uh, but yeah, no price tag on the dog. We want to make sure we're helping whoever needs it. That's why donation drives are so wonderful. That, I mean, that's hundreds of dollars that we didn't have to spend because of your guys' generosity. So appreciate that a lot. Um, if we had to put a price tag on a dog, it'd be about $30,000, $35,000 for actual costs plus dollar amount spent on the time training the dog at an hourly 
uh, rate. Oh boy. What was, oh, I was gonna share a couple stories, if that's okay, just to kind of give you an idea um, on how beneficial the dogs are. So a couple of my favorites um, all have to do with autism, unless I think of a veteran one that makes me cry. Um, the autism ones, though, we had one mom come in in that first period where they're working with dogs that they know will not be their dog, but they need to get the, the skill set going. Um, she came in, and it was the middle of the afternoon, and we have bedrooms at our facility for clients to stay overnight in. When they're training, they can come from out of town, out of state. They can come from Waverly and stay at our facility to train overnight with their dog and get everything, get all the kinks out before they take a dog home. So she and her son and the dog were hanging out in the bedroom, and we said, Mom, why don't you come out here? We're going to let them lay together by themselves and see what they do because he wasn't really interacting with the dogs that much and so we close the door and we have security cameras in there so we can watch for nightmares overnight for the veterans so we pulled the camera up on her phone and we, she was listening through the door and she saw in the middle of the day she saw her son close the curtains he put a pillow under the dog's head he pulled the comforter back over the dog he turned the light off he leaned into the dog kissed him on the head and said good night i love you and she just, okay, I'm going to cry. <laughs> she burst into tears, and we said, what's going on? Like, talk to us. Why are you emotional about this? And she said, that's the exact routine I do every single night, and he has never responded to it. She said, now I know that he knows what I'm saying to him, and he understands. You guys can't look at me like that. <laughs> oh. uh, so that one was pretty special. Kind of going along that, another child was 11 years old getting his first dog. He's about to get a second dog from us. And um, wow. uh, <laughs> any questions? Um, he, every single night for 11 years, had slept right between mom and dad or maybe would start in his room and end up between mom and dad because he just felt safer there. And uh, their second home visit with the dog, he had slept the whole night in his room. And she expected, she saw him sleeping. She turned the light off and she was like, ah, I kind of expected him to come back um, and sleep between us. And he never did. So when she woke him up in the morning, she said, hey, buddy, by the time I got here to, to put you to bed, you were already asleep and you stayed in your bed the whole night by yourself. And he said, that's okay, mom. I had my dog. And now, I mean, he's on his second dog and he's still sleeping every night in his room by himself. Nancy, you got to stop crying. <laughs> I see you over there. Um... So that's, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, and she also was one that taught him a script because he wasn't confident talking to his, his classmates, but she taught him a script. This is your name. This is your dog's name. Would you like to pet your dog? Which gave him the control, and it gave him the confidence to speak to his classmates. So he's just blossomed into a whole different person since we first met him. Okay, now any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so where do we get our dogs from? You're right, we do have breeders that we work with who maybe have a litter of puppies and they don't have all of them sold and they wanna see if we think that's a good dog for them or they'll say, hey, you got a dog from this breeding before and you really liked it, we're gonna do that again, would you like to look at them? And so we kind of work with breeders in that sense, especially for the golden retrievers and golden doodles. For the labs, we have mostly our own breeding program where we have dogs from quality, good quality breeders who have passed a number of genetic tests to make sure that they're gonna produce healthy dogs. And then we specifically pick a stud who we think is going to give us, you know, if we, we think we have a lot of autism clients coming up, we need some calm dogs, um, let's find us a, a dog who's gonna give us some calm puppies type of thing. If we like the puppies that came from it, we'll repeat it. If not, we'll pick a new breeding. Um, so he's from, our breeding program, uh, and he has like five or six, maybe seven uh, siblings in the program too. And so we like them, we, we love them, they're great dogs. Yeah, unfortunately his mom is spayed now and she's just a pet. So we just do a couple breedings and then they become a pet after that. They put in their time and ready to relax, but they, they do produce some really great puppies that we then know their complete history. We know where they came from, we know their moms, genetic history, their grandparents, and we can kind of see how they grow from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we call them our release dogs or our change of career dogs who don't make the program as a service dog. We get about 40 to 50 puppies in a year, I believe. Um, right now we have just over 85-ish dogs in training and only 50% make them as service dogs. And that's a great percentage. We're proud of that. Um, so we have, you know, 
30 or so dogs who aren't cut out to be a service dog for a number of reasons, behavioral or health. Behavioral is that super high, super low energy. Maybe they bark or whine a lot. Um, maybe they get aggressive at some point. And then health could be eyes, heart, joints, hips, um, elbows, a number of things. Maybe they're incontinent and they can't hold their bladder. So for all of those dogs, the first, very first option is you offer them to the person who raised them. They had a really great bond with that dog for a year. You know, they put in a lot of work. You see if they want them as a pet. If they say, not the right dog, not the right time, then we look, okay, is this dog capable of doing a different job? So we just had one this year that had super high energy, constantly looking for a toy, always looking for a toy, like looking for a toy. He is now in a program in California for search and rescue dogs. Yes, and he's doing great. They love him. They send us updates all the time, and that's just what he was born to do. So we have to recognize that. If there is no good job for them, they're just released out as a pet. So we find a good home for them. Um, some are faster to, to adopt out than others, depending on the reason, but we always find a good home. And I do have applications for that with me today, if anyone is interested. What else? Want to see some stuff? All right. Do you need me to keep my microphone for this? Just go in here. Okay. Sorry, okay. I don't think so. I just need to get to the questions and see this first. Um, okay, come here. All right, so first we're going to do positional commands. I am going to preface that I am not his trainer. I've actually only worked with him one time before this. Abe left. Thank you. So like I said, this is his home base. They can do a front and no one's gonna step on a dog or push a dog to get out of the way to get closer to a person. So he's giving me a nice boundary here. Left. In training, they get lots of treats. <laughs> Left. Behind. Good. So now he's watching my back, right? If I'm at a gas station where there's no true line, no counter, or uh, no line at the counter, everyone just kind of huddles up. Um, they can stand behind you and keep people further away. Good boy. Good boy here. Sit. All right, we'll do some retrieve. Sit. So I have two dumbbells with me. One is plastic, one is wood. We have them practice picking up all sorts of materials. We do metal, like keys, plastic. Um, we do phones, cell phones. Credit cards, paper bags, plastic bags, t-shirts are really difficult because when they pick it up, they usually put a paw on it and it rips out of their mouth. So we want them to work through that and keep the shirt in their mouth. Um, hotel keys, water bottles, crunch in their mouth. It's kind of awkward for them. These dogs have such a, a soft grip that they can hold like a styrofoam package of meat with the saran wrap around it and not poke through the saran wrap. So we love these breeds. You cheater. <laughs> Sit. Now that I know he wants that, I'm not going to let him get it. So we're going to go for the plastic one first. Here. Leave it. Sit. Get it. Bring. Give. Good boy. Sit. So they bring on command. They'll hold it as long as we need them to on command. Get it. Bring. Give. Good boy. Sit. Get it. Hold. 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 No. Sit. Good. Give. Good boy. Good boy. Oh. So you could see how excited he was to retrieve. I mean, you can tell he just loves working. Good boy. Those are the only commands I've been taught to work with him on. Are there any questions on those? Yeah? So, uh, so 
Not really. So once the dog knows the task, we start to fade out the treats. Sit. Down. Down. He's getting so many today because there are a lot of potential distractions, and I don't work with him that often, so I want him to keep his attention on me. But once they have that bond and they know those tasks by heart, my rule is once the dog is doing it 10 out of 10 times, that's when you add the command to it. And once they're performing the command 10 out of 10 times, that's when you remove the treats. So that's how I go about it. Um, and I mostly have worked with the younger puppies, but um, no, they, they'll gain a lot of weight if they, <laughs> if they continue getting this many treats throughout their lifetime. Because we keep them so active while they're in training, but once they go to the home, I mean, think about your daily life. They're not running around in the airing yard for, excuse me, an hour at a time when they're with their person. Um, but, so going along with that, when the dog is performing their commands with their person, it's actually only about 30 seconds of work at a time. They're gonna get your attention, they're gonna interrupt the flashback, they're going to keep the child safe for about 30 seconds, and then their job is done for the next maybe three hours. Um, so they, they uh, do a lot of sitting when they get placed. <laughs> which is fine. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's when they're out of the house. So when they're at home, we do a lot of training at our facility with the vest off. Um, but when they're at home, you take the vest off. And that way, even though their vest is off, that doesn't mean their ears are off. You know, they're still focusing on their person and performing tasks as needed, but they can play and be a dog. When their vest is on out in public, they know that that's not an option. They're always working. Um, so basically whenever, they're, they're working all day, but they're focused on working whenever you're out of the house, is the way I would put it. Yeah. Most difficult command. Probably picking up items. I would say because it's it's a little unnatural for them to hold it for so long and especially when they're weird objects like a set of keys that's tastes funny it's making noise it's maybe poking their tongue um, their inhibition is going to be to spit it out so to hold that uh, I think is probably one of them and that's the test they have to pass in order to go into stage three for a veteran dog um, and for an autism dog it's doing the tethering out in public with distractions around you so I would say those are the two most difficult tasks for those clients. Yeah. What else are you wondering about? Anything? Yeah. Always a waiting list, but active. Um, I know right now our clients are actually pretty low, so placements will hopefully happen faster but it, it ebbs and flows. Um, last year, we had a lot of applicants, but they weren't ready to come in and work with us because they wanted to stay home and stay safe. Um, but yeah, always people ready. We'll never have enough dogs to, to produce for the people who need them, just because the need is always growing. But yeah, active waiting list. <laughs> Big stretch. Um, but yeah, always taking new applicants if you guys know anyone. I also have applications here with me for autism and veteran. You can also find them on our website if you know somebody who could benefit from a service dog. Please don't. Uh, another thing I just thought of is if you see a dog out in public, best thing to do is act like they're not there. They're a medical device. You could think of them as a cane or a wheelchair. You wouldn't ask somebody if you could have a ride in their chair. Don't ask somebody if you can pet their dog. Um, well, one veteran told me, when I have my dog out in public with me, I feel normal. He said, that's when I feel most normal. I feel like I can do things. I can conquer today. I can go to the grocery store by myself. As soon as somebody says, look, there's a dog, or comes up and pets without asking, he said, suddenly there's a spotlight on me and I'm not normal. He said, it reminds me that I have a disability. So we always just recommend, if you absolutely must, I would recommend, first and foremost, don't make eye contact with the dog. Don't look at them, don't talk to them. Talk to the person and try to read the dog's vest. His vest says, <laughs> I don't have a treat. His vest says in training. So I am not the person who's going to be receiving him, so I'm happy to answer questions. But if it says service dog or PTSD dog or something like that, I would recommend just walking away. Mm -hmm. 
we don't necessarily train them how to tell us their needs, but we can, after a while, you pick up on your dog's behaviors. You know, if they're acting funny, they might have to go out. Um, otherwise, we just try to get them on a routine where we know most of them will have free water just sitting out. Um, but we'll get them on a routine that they eat at a certain time and we take them out maybe every three hours and make sure we also go potty before entering any public place so that they don't have an accident. Um, so they get a lot of opportunities. I would say just keep them on a schedule. Yeah. Fostering, reach out to us first. We'll put you in touch with the right person. And from there, we do three training sessions with her. Her name is Sarah. And we do one at our facility only. You're working with dogs about the age of Abe here. So you can have a dog who's not going to challenge you as much on your first couple of trainings. So you work with the dog at the facility, get just sits and downs down. You learn that they have to be right next to you. Their feet are lined up with your feet, things like that, learning the, the appropriate commands. And then from there, she'll kind of advance it. And then the last training session is out in public. So she goes maybe to Walmart or Hy-Vee with you. You learn what to do if somebody approaches you and doesn't ask to pet. You learn what to do if a manager is trying to kick you out and you're legally allowed to be there. Um, so you're working with older dogs. We typically recommend weekend fostering or holiday fostering, which is a longer period of, uh, it's like, I try to explain Christmas Eve to New Year's Day type of time frames where we would like our staff to have time off. We would like the dogs to be able to be in homes and experiencing family and food and presents and glitter and whatever else comes with holidays. And it's just a good training experience for them. And then it gives our staff, our kennel staff, a break if we can get all the dogs out. And uh, so we usually recommend that before you take a puppy, but because we are so far away, we'd probably make an exception. Um, if you have experience with dogs, that helps, but it's not required. You can have other dogs in the home. You can live on a farm. You can have never touched a dog in your life. I mean, we take anyone and everyone. We know it's not for everybody. It's very, very, very difficult to give a dog back, but it is so worth it. When you, the child that slept in his own bed for the first time, I, that's why I was getting teary eyed because I fostered that dog. And so knowing the dog, you're going to do it again. <laughs> the dog that I wanted as a pet changed his life, you know, and it, I felt like I did something with training him for a year and, and uh, knowing that he really saved that, that boy and his parents a lot of stress. Um, but it's not for everyone. Definitely not. <laughs> but worth it. Yeah, monetary as far as fostering, I would have to ask Sarah to be sure. I know we will recover, what am I trying to say? Reimburse, gosh, <laughs> reimburse 100% um, of the cost if necessary. But I don't know if food I know used to be required for you to buy. I don't know if that's the case anymore. But I know as far as like surgeries or vaccinations or whatever, yeah, we can cover that. I believe think if I had to guess, I believe a crate and food is required, but I, I don't know for sure. Anything else? Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll be here for a little bit longer if you guys want to come meet us over at the table. Um, if you do come say hi to Abe, he has to hold a controlled position. So if he stands up, just pull your hand back and we'll get him back into a down that teaches him that he can be approached, but he can't approach people. Um, but yeah, come say hi and ask any questions if you'd like. Take some paperwork from us, whatever. Thanks for having us today. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Scared of him. <laughs> Did that scare you? <laughs>